Hey guys, welcome back to the BDB Podcast. As you can see, we're actually live. You're watching the audio or listening to the audio. We're actually doing this live as well, which will be posted up the video. I'm super pumped. I have a great friend of mine here that I've known for a few years, and we made a relationship and created a relationship through exchanging value, continually having conversations, helping each other out, making impact and impacting each other's lives. A mutual friend of ours would say making deposits into each other's bank accounts, the bank account of Relationship Capital. I've really been loving watching him over the last few years. He's actually going to be speaking at our event, bdblive.com. It's going to be phenomenal. He has an amazing story. But over the last few years, I've watched him build a business, very much so on the side that now is full-time, it's going to explode, to millions of dollars while impacting hundreds of people's incomes along the way, including him and his families, and soon real family, hopefully I can say that, uh, which is going to be really awesome. So welcome to the show, my friend, Douglas James. What's going on, guys? Hey, Nicholas, I really appreciate you having me on the show, brother. Man, that's like the nicest thing anyone has ever said about me. I appreciate that, man. Thanks. <laughs> so obviously, we're at his house right now, which is awesome. It's overlooking San Diego. The views are phenomenal. Right here, we have Petco Park. Okay. But for the people that don't know who Douglas James is, I know you so well now. I want people to be able to get in depth. I don't just bring anyone on the show. I don't definitely don't bring anyone on the stage mm-hmm. twice, which is pretty ridiculous. I don't. Who else has been in on the stage twice? I don't even know. What did you think life was going to be like a few years? Take us back to like kind of how you grew up, and then into a little bit about your background and why you even got into business and, and what you really thought life was going to be like and how things have changed. Wow, what a story, man. Um, yeah, so originally I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Who dat? If there's any Sinks fans out there. <laughs> um, yeah, man, from New Orleans. And, uh, you know, I was one of those people growing up. I was a, a bad kid in school. I was pretty much a D student. I didn't like college. I mean, I, so I didn't like school at all. Um, I, I was not like, I was always a rule breaker, you know. So growing up, when I graduated high school, barely actually failed the second and seventh grade got held back for because I couldn't read. Um, the teacher always told me I had ADHD, all this, all this stuff, and uh, I was just a bad student, man. There was no way that I was going to go to college or anything like that. Got out of high school, and um, I started to bartend, and uh, I was making okay money, but uh, dude, I was bartending till like three a.m. in the morning. I was partying until like five a.m., and uh, it wasn't the best lifestyle, you know. Obviously, there was you know, a little bit of medicinal drugs use. No, not medicinal. No, I was, we were being bad, man. And, um, I did that for like a year. I was 19 years old. There was no sign of me of having any future at all. And, uh, pretty much my family gave me an ultimatum. They're like, you're going to go to college. You're going to join the military or you're going to get the hell out of my house. I don't know if I can curse on here, but yeah, you're fine. You're going to get the fuck out of my house. So, um, Obviously, all three of those options didn't give me my family. I was very comfortable, you know, where I lived. Uh, I had a family that took care of me very much, and um, well, my grandparents. And uh, growing up, it was actually very, very hard because you know I did have a father at the time that wasn't the best father, you know. So I think I got into all these bad things as I became a young adult. Um, because I watched him, you know, sleep around with other women. I watched him drink. I watched him gamble. I watched him beat my mom. These are all extremely hard things to talk about. And I'm at the point where like, I've already forgiven and moved on from it. So it's a lot easier for me to talk about it. I think, uh, I definitely talked in the past about it. And, um, it was, you know, like I, I would stumble upon my words. I would crack in my voice cause, uh, it's happening a little bit now, you know? So But I've been able to overcome that, and um, finally, having that ultimatum, I was left with a very, very tough decision, because I did love my family. You know, I was, I've always been a family man, and um, like I said, I wasn't going to go to college, was not cut out, you know, I was a D student, and I decided to jump in the military. So I jumped in the military, uh, went up going for the Navy, because I had a great grandfather that was on the USS Arizona, which got sunk by Pearl Harbor. So there was some history there, and uh, I thought that would be probably, you know, it's it's in my genes, it's in my blood. I might as well take a shot instead of the Air Force. I wasn't going to be in the Air Force and the Marines. Marines went to war. Uh, I didn't want to be in the planes, you know, with the Air Force. So the Navy, being on boats and being on water, me and my grandfather grew up kind of fishing and stuff. So I was like, that that seems pretty cool. So 
jumped in the Navy, man. Um, shipped me off to boot How camp. How old were you during that time? I was uh, I was 20 years old at that time. So I was 20 years old. Shipped me off to boot camp, and uh, they had me. They had you picking jobs, you know, when in boot camp. And uh, I was looking at all the positions, and the one that intrigued me the most was being in IT, because um, I was actually kind of geeky. I was into video games. I was into computers. Um, I used to like to take stuff apart and put them back together, you know, so I was like, I'm going to be an information system technician. That sounds pretty cool. So I applied for that job while I was in boot camp, and then uh, they bring you to pretty much a moment of truth about, about, I think it was seven days in, it's like a moment of truth. They're like, if you ever stole, if you ever did drugs, if you did ever arrested, if you did any of this bad stuff, we need to know about it. You're not going to be in trouble. You're not going to lose your job. We just need to know about it. I'm like, all right, you know what? I have I have some history, and um, apparently, uh, if I just tell them, if I'm just honest about it, everything will be good, right? So we get to the moment of truth. I go in that little room, and they're like, you know, have you stole? Have you ever been arrested? And uh, I was like, yeah, actually, I was arrested. So here's a little secret. I actually got arrested when I was 17 years old for stealing from Target. All right, baller, dude. Uh, so I, it was an ingenious. It was an ingenious way. I don't mean to brag. I'm not proud of it by any means, but I pretty much figured out how to steal like five thousand dollars in electronics for two months under the radar. Um, I mean, I don't want to teach you guys like listening right now how to steal from Target, but pretty much when people were checking out, I had all the stuff ready to go at the register and I demagnetized it as if they were purchasing it. So I would ring it up and then I would take it off their bill, but I would put it in their cart. So on camera. It looked like they were buying it, and there was a paper trail, but it seemed as if stuff was just going back. Maybe it was defected. So I did that, bro, um, and for two months, and I remember walking out of work one day with a bag of goods, and uh, I heard my name. As soon as I heard my name walking out of Target that day, I knew it was game over. They took me to jail. So fast forward, like I said, into that moment of truth in boot camp, um, they asked me, you know, ever so ever the drugs ever stole anything. I said, yeah, when I was 17, I got arrested, you know, I, I stole and uh, I didn't bring up the drugs and they were like, oh, well, you don't qualify for IT. Have a good day. I was like, what? This is like the job I wanted. Like I told my family. Thing switch. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I, I was like, I was stunned. I told my family, like I was going to be in IT. This is what I am. I'm, I'm like this geeky nerd. I'm into computers and stuff. I remember calling my family, just bawling, telling my grandma, like, I don't know what I want to do. Should I just come home? And my grandma was just like, come home. Just come home. It's going to be okay. We'll find something else. Out. So I was like, oh, really? Like, you just told me like two weeks ago, you get the hell out of my house or, you know, you never invited over again. So, man, I was stuck in such a hard decision. My, my uncle was telling me to stay. My mom was telling me to stay. Um, so they gave me some jobs to pick from. So I chose, they were telling me I can either chip paint off of a boat, be a boatswain's mate, or become a hospital corpsman and, you know, work in a hospital. I was like, I'll do that. My mom was like, yeah, there's six doctors in our family. There's some medical in your, in your blood. Just go do that. So I became hospital corpsman. And, uh, dude, for the next 10 years, it was, I got to really do and see some amazing things. I ended up getting an associate's degree as a medical technologist. So I was pretty much the guy that you came to see when you needed to test your blood or your pee or your vomit or what all your bodily fluids. Like I would run tests and I would, I would pretty much tell the doctor what's wrong with it. I was pretty much a doctor and not get paid as a doctor. It's pretty cool. Um, but you know, through that time, fast forward, I, I was stationed all over the world, got to live in Italy for two years, really get to appreciate like different cultures and diversity. And that gave me like a lot of perspective on how much better we have it here and, and seeing other cultures and how they operate. And I really feel like if there's anything you're going to spend your money on that means anything is, is really experiencing that. Like that, that gave me so much perspective, made me appreciate so much more that we have here. But I'd probably say the most impactful trip I ever took, actually, was going on a deployment back in 2014. Um, it was on the USS Mercy. It's actually stationed here, right over here in San Diego. 
And um, that mission was, like I said, it was humanitarian. So our job was to go to all the Pacific Islands and render free medical care and build schools and build hospitals and do all that cool stuff. And I was like, man, this is, this is awesome. This is like the first trip that I actually took where I was actually going to help humanity. You know, and I've done various, you know, volunteer things through through all the different places I was I was living, feeding the homeless and all that stuff. But this was the first time where for seven months all I did was help poor people better their lives. Like it, it was just incredible. So our first trip, we get to you know we stopped at Hawaii. We did a little party in Hawaii. It was cool. But <laughs> we get to the Philippines. And, uh, man, we went to a very poor part of the island. Like, here in, in this part of the Philippines, the kids, like, didn't have schools. Like, it was shocking. Like, they were literally, uh, it was just like a concrete slab. It was like little tiki huts. Um, they were drawing with chalk on the concrete. It was, you know, seeing the kids come in, they were playing with balls that were deflated. Like, they didn't have a soccer field. So, it just, it was just, it, it it was the first time where I really saw how, what poverty really was. I actually didn't really get to experience that in a different parts of the world I was in. But we, you know, built schools for them. We built soccer fields. And uh, it was definitely the most rewarding experience. I just remember the last day um, when we were there. I think we were there for 14 days. We, we built the schools. Um, the Navy has something called the CBs, and that's pretty much the construction battalion. And being a, a medical corpsman, uh, I went out to help them, you know, if they got like a nail in their finger or something crazy like that, I was there to patch them up. And uh, I went, I, I was like, look, I want to go help them build these schools. It's going to be awesome. So for 14 days, every single day, I was out there. I was the only corpsman out there rendering aid. It was like, it was 20 different CVs, and I was the only corpsman out there. Nobody else wanted to do it. I was like, man, I'm going to go do this. So, man, um, I, I tell you, the last day we were there, uh, we showed up, and the kids showed up. We were all there. We had a little ceremony, and I was there every day, and uh, there was a, a group of kids, you know, that came every day, and I was giving them, like, little snacks, and they just loved me. I just love, I love kids, and I just remember on that last day, you know, I had a, we had boxes of books, I had boxes of apples, crayons. We had the new school, and I remember all these kids coming up to me, just hugging me, saying thank you. It was, uh, it, it's single-handedly like the, the most, the biggest moment in my whole career in the Navy. And um, before you even go forward, there's a few things. And first off, that's cool because, as most people know, that's kind of how I got my start as well. Was that we we went to 14 different countries or something like that, and throughout that time, that's where I got to experience poverty but not unhappiness. When they got the crayons, like those kids were so happy. And I realized people always ask me, why did I go from helping poor people to coming to America and helping men basically get rich is what they think. Mm -hmm. And I go, no, I'm helping rich people that are very poor inside. Like they don't have that same happiness level that you got to experience for no actual tangible money. Mm -hmm. Like that's the experience that you brought up. But one thing I wanted to go back to real quick is that you talked a lot about that you had past family members in the military, past family members that were doctors. And it seemed that a lot on your mind was like, oh, that runs in the family. Oh, that runs in the family. Mm -hmm. And the scary part of that for all of us and, and maybe the people listening as well is that we also think about the things that run in our family that are negative. Right. We think like, oh, my dad struggled with this, my mom struggled with this, my grandpa struggled with this. And then they try to label you by that. Oh, you're just like this person. You're just like that. And there's positives, but there's also negatives. I want to know on your journey so far – what, me and you, I think, are at a level where a lot of our family has never been before. Like, mm -hmm. we're in the new territory, right. which means that we're doing something that's never been done. How did you separate yourself, your identity, from that of the past family members that you've had to be able to do something that's never been done for the other people right now that feel held back by what their family's gone through and what they think they're struggling with as well? Yeah, man, that's, that's a really good question. You know, I think that um, for me... I mean, up until that point in my career, right, uh, to be able to do something like that and uh, essentially live with more of a purpose, um, I really was thrown into the fire, to be honest with you, at that point. Like I tell you, my family gave me that ultimatum. Um, I went out and started seeing the world, starting to get a different perspective of how people live and, and diversity. And um, I think for me, I really came into my own as... You know, I have things that have haunted me for years that still haunt me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not 
ashamed to say that I still have a therapist that I go see once a month, you know? And I think that's, I think that is probably the most valuable thing. If anybody's listening, go see a therapist. Like you don't realize how much, uh, your past and maybe things you've experienced as a child has affected you and your decisions today. Like it's insane, you know, and it's really scary because you never actually get to actually come into your own person and share your heart with the world. You know, you kind of stay in this little bubble thing and this is all it is. This is all I know, you know? So I think for me, I had a realization where I never wanted to, you know, grow up the way I did. You know, my, my, I never wanted my family or my future kids to grow up and see the things that I had to. I never had my, my family. I didn't ever wanted them to see, have a father that don't know if they're going to be at home that night or if they didn't even know if they were going to eat that night. You know, these, and I, I always wanted to, I wanted to have, be a faithful husband. I want to always be a loving father. And the, unfortunately, those are things that I didn't get growing up. I mean, there was moments where I feel like I did have it. And my dad did have all the right intentions. I know he did, but something was mentally wrong with him. It truly was mentally wrong with him, you know? So, and I've, I've been able to just forgive him and, and move on from it. And I think that's the biggest thing to overcome is just say, Hey, I'm not going to allow this to affect my future, my future kids. That would be completely selfish of me. I need to be bigger and move on from it. And I think just having that realization with that past um, and being able to just embrace this opportunity to be in the military, to do all I can, um, is going to really excel my future and give me a good shot at like what's life got for me. You know what I'm saying? And, um, it was awesome because once I did that and I had that switch that kind of went off and kind of came into my own as a person and gave up those things that held me psychologically, you know, I took off in the military. Like a lot of people don't realize that I'm so successful today you know, it really started in the military. I literally took the energy that I was putting into things in the military and just did them outside the military. And here we go. Here we go. So are what today. were some of the principles then that not everyone's going to be able to go and listen to the military? But right. What are the principles? Right. So what were some of the key, not just the energy, because I get that, the work ethic, the grit. Mm -hmm. What were some of the principles you learned in the military that you directly used in your today business that we'll get into in a second? Yeah. Um, I think the first thing is treat people were respect you know um i growing up i didn't know i didn't understand that like uh if, if somebody tells you good morning say good morning back you know somebody in the military we salute each other you know we salute higher authority you know we have we, we show respect to people that have served or might have died for their country right so i think those types of things and real you know has really instilled in me that I was actually t able to take an implement from the military. I think that uh, respect for others, and I probably, this one's actually pretty interesting, uh, making my bed every morning, every time, even as Sonia, my wife, that's right over here, uh, every single morning we got out of bed, I make the bed. You know, sometimes she may not get to it right away, but I feel like that bed really shows how my day is gonna go. Like I start every single day with success. I made one successful thing happen in that morning, right when I woke up and I was making my bed. So did, in the past, I'm assuming there was some point that you didn't make a bed, right? Absolutely Before, not. No. So check, yeah. So let's do this then. Then all of a sudden you started making a bed and at first that was a super conscious decision. Mm -hmm. Now that you're making the bed, do you still feel like the, oh, I need to make my bed, like thinking about it? Or is it just like a habit now that you do naturally and you feel better, like you feel better doing it than not doing it? What's yeah. that like? No, for now, at this point, I'm doing it with such purpose and intent because if that, if I leave that bed and it's undone, it's something I'm going to be thinking about. I'm like, wow, that's, that's stacked up. What's the next thing that's going to stack up and go wrong or not be completely Dude, that's a principle right there. Like you didn't yeah. make your bed. You started to, I'm sure at first it was annoying and you had to like learn how to do it. Now it's something you can't even imagine going that. It's kind of like working out. I'm right. sure at some point for both of us, there was a point where we didn't work out. Yeah. Obviously, when you're a baby, you can't work out as well. So no matter what, everyone has been through a period of the time where they couldn't work out. And now for people like you and I, you were just at the gym before this. Yeah. Well, and that wasn't all, all of the case. I kind of missed some of my story actually growing up, you know, being overweight and stuff. But I mean, should, you, should I talk about that a little bit? Well, it, was it something that you think affected you? When it came to business, like obviously we talk about three-dimensional yeah. businessman and yeah. I don't feel like you can truly find your purpose 
and truly who you are if you can't treat yourself the right way, right. if you can't take care of yourself. I, I feel like if you can't value yourself, how are other people supposed to value you highly? Right. You talked exactly. about getting high ticket clients. Mm-hmm. These are clients that are investing a lot of money in what you do. Mm-hmm. I'm going, man, if you can't invest a lot of money in you, why would other people all of a sudden want to just invest all this money in you? Exactly. Like psychologically. So tell yeah. me a little bit about the story. Because I don't really yeah. know that much about it. Yeah, man. Um, so it's not something that I actually talk about. And here's the thing. I'll just throw this out there. As I'm growing as an entrepreneur and speaking and doing more podcasts and teaching on stage and stuff, I'm really starting to, to really hone in on like my story. And I think that's what's really resonated with so many people. And that's, that's why... I really owe a lot of my story to my success because I've been coming to be able to come out and be honest about it, be transparent. And so many people appreciate that. And, you know, the story about like my weight has always, that's been something that I really don't like to talk about because, you know, for, I would probably say most of my life up until I was 22, I was self-conscious about my body and the way it looked, you know, um, and, you know, to give a little bit more back context growing up you know when i say we didn't know if we were going to eat or not if we did eat it was most likely a big mac and a large fry because it was cheap and that's what my dad decided to feed me then right and um it was that all the time like that's all we ate and then if we did go out and eat it was like a chinese buffet you know so you can see over years and years and years as a kid that stacked up you know and uh growing up in school i was picked on a lot and I was told that I wouldn't be anyone and that I was always going to be fat. And I was a kid that nobody hated, you know, and that, that showed up in my grades and showed up how, uh, you know, how I carried myself as a person into a young adult. And I got into those bad habits that I saw my dad doing with the drugs and the drinking, you know. And then finally, thank God for like my grandparents, which are like my second parents, gave me that ultimatum, you know. So I think that... Um, Going into the military, obviously, there's boot camp, there's, you have to run and do all those things. I cut down the weight, you know, and then quickly realize that whether you're in the military or you're working a job or if you're corporate or if you're a businessman, I've realized this today, people give a shit what you look like. Like, if you show up looking like a bag of ass, expect bad results, you know, but if you show up trim cut, you, you obviously care about the way you look, you care about your body, you know, what you're putting in your mouth then you'll have better results. That's just the way it works. You know, so I, I learned early on that in the military, looks care. You know, people give a crap about what look what looks good, you know, so you have to look sharp in uniform. You have to, they call it PT or physical training. You have to do that every morning with the group, you know. Um, so I'm glad that I was able to take those skills early on and, and, and learn that because it propelled my success in the military. And I think that all those things, you know, showing respect for people, making my bed, having small routines that I did every single morning, piling up my wins throughout the day, you know, getting my workout, focusing on my health and my fitness. Um, I was able to actually make actually a, arguably a very good career in the military. You know, a lot of people look at my time in the military and they're like, damn, you should have kept going. You would have been like a master chief or an officer or something, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I could have been whatever rank and never any probably any political position that I wanted on the military active duty officer side because I was so good. And, you know, for you you guys watching, if you know about military rank, I don't know if you know about military rank, but I made E6 in five years. Wow. That's unheard of. The average time to make E6 on active duty in the military is about 12 years. You know, so I did it in less than half the time. And that, that just goes to show you where my head was, the realizations that I made and how I was able to take advantage of what the Navy teaches you, you know, yeah. because... Also with that, um, it wasn't always about me. It was about the team. It was about other people, you know, so those were other great values that I was able to take from the military. So I always brought people with me. I was always in front of, uh, of groups of people teaching things that they didn't know. Like I was a basic life support instructor. If there was any kind of birthday or celebration to put on, I was the guy. I was pretty much an event coordinator. I just love the heritage. I love being a part of those things. And everything I did, I always took people up with me. And I was rewarded. I made rank quick, went on that deployment, uh, you know, uh, built the schools, did the hospitals, always brought people with me, made people part of the part of any event that I put on. And um, the higher ups and the officers recognized me for it, you know. And uh, like I, when I tell you, if I if I were to stay in the military, if I did another 10 years, I probably would have been a high ranking officer, 
you know, probably making a hundred grand a year somewhere, which is shit to be honest, <laughs> you know, financially, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, uh, you know, there, there is obviously, um, I, I would never take back anything after in service. Yeah. yeah, it's very necessary. We need the military. We need to protect our country 100%. and our values. And, and, our and there's no one out there that I think would believe that military, anyone in the military is paid fairly. But also, mm-hmm. it just shows like even firefighters. Firefighters, uh, I know David Goggins, uh, one mm-hmm. of my mentors, Yost, is good. they deployed together. Mm-hmm. He has that book that like everyone right now is, is reading, Can't Hurt Me. And he retired from the military and he went to go be a firefighter. Not for the money. For him, it's to challenge himself. But just to think that there's men out there, women out there in all different types of military and, and service in different areas mm-hmm. that are making no money, but they're doing it not for the money, right? Like, right. no, nobody's like money hungry in in the military. I would assume like there, it just yeah. doesn't exist. So, uh, yeah. I think it's really interesting. I haven't really been I've been able to hear that cool part of your story, and I would love to really jump into. What inspired you to do something different or was like, was there some like calling where you're like, man, I, I have something to do that's not bigger, but just different. And it's bigger for you. Like something on the inside of you. And that's how it was for me. Cleaning carpets. I could have ran the carpet cleaning business and bought other ones and made a bigger one. Right. Yet it wasn't accomplishing the thing that I knew I was supposed to do. Right. It was just going to give me the money and maybe the prestige that I wanted. Mm-hmm. So tell me about that transition. How did you all of a sudden get into the world that you're in now? <laughs> I know. It's crazy, right? I will say you're right. Firefighters don't become firefighters because of the 30, 40 grand a year. They do it because it's a calling, just like a Navy SEAL. You know, who, who wants to be a Navy SEAL for $15 an hour? Yeah. I, I sure <laughs> All right. Yeah. But it's a calling. It's, it's, it, there's something more there. You know, it's a higher purpose. So, but anyway, yeah, back to, back to my story though. Um, all right, so I mean, I left off my my military career journey at, on that deployment, right? Going to Papua New Guinea, you know, building the uh, schools in the Philippine, Philippines. When we got to Papua New Guinea, we saw that 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 was like real poverty there. They didn't barely had any clothes. They didn't have a place wow. to sleep, pretty much. They didn't have hospitals. Um, they had some. They had some of that infrastructure, but you had to drive like hours to get wow. to it. So we actually went to more of the remote parts of the island and helped them set up small clinics and build homes and stuff like that. Life-changing experience, life-changing. You know, I, I recommend everyone go do some kind of philanthropy work or get involved in some type of organization. It's just going to change your life. But, you know, that deployment just made me realize that I want to be doing so much more. Like, military is super cool. I get to have these experiences. But at the same time, I'm told where to go, when to eat, when to shit, when to do, pretty much operate my whole life. Having a family is so difficult. You have to sacrifice so much. I mean, look, I was on a boat for seven months, and I had just started a relationship which with who is now my current wife and pregnant with my firstborn child, you know? So it was very, very hard. And, um, you know, go, that honestly, that deployment was a big test to our relationship if that was going to work or not and uh when i got back realizing that i had this amazing woman and realizing that i wanted to do so much more than what the military has to offer i feel like that i could be doing so much more to help so many people's lives but on i wanted to do it on my terms i didn't want to be told when to do it when i could have the opportunity i didn't want to have to take a test and sell cupcakes or whatever it is I had to do, go on deployments to, to make rank and being told that I'm worthy of this next bigger paycheck. I didn't want, I wanted to make more money because I had more impact. I did more things for people, you know? And I think that realization coming back from that deployment, it was like, I got to get into something. You know, Sonia came and met me. Um, you know, we had a little ceremony. Uh, I had roses ready for her. She came to pick me up from the deployment. And just seeing her just lit a fire under me. Like this woman waited for me for seven months. I waited for her for seven months. And to tell you the truth, I wasn't the best man uh, faithfully before that deployment. Um, but she waited for me and I waited for her on deployment. And when I got back, like we've been together every every single day. There has not been a day we missed together. Unless she like took off to Dallas to see her family. I don't know. Some, you know, small trips like that. But I got back and I'm like, I'm going to have a family 
uh, that's never going to have to worry about finances. I'm going to be able to see and do whatever I want with my family, whatever I want. So obviously there's like, you can type on the internet and be like, oh, you know, I want to quit my job or how do I make money quick or how do I make money faster? And there's all these things that, I mean, for us, I was like, does network marketing work? You know, like little things right. like that. You're searching all these sketchy websites with caution tape. Remember yeah. on the landing pages back in the day that would have like caution tape, click here to enter into the secret underground way to make right. money online. Yeah. Like, crazy thing. So what was that journey like for you? Yeah. I mean, so I literally searched on uh, Google actually how to kill my job. You know, that was, that was the keyword search I used. And turns out there was a sneaky program that was ranking for that keyword that I end up going down the rabbit hole and spending thousands of dollars on. Um, and the crazy part is I was actually 30 grand debt. Like I was, I was not proud of it. Um, I still, there was still a lot of some tendencies that were affecting me as I was growing, you know, coming into a young adult and I like to live life in fast lane. I, I, I thought that if I had like cool stuff, people would like me more. You know, that's kind of how I thought. And I think a, a lot of people can resonate with that, Yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, fast forward in today, obviously, you know, it, travel and family and, and relationships is, is number one. You know, the cool stuff's nice to have, but that's another conversation. But I did, I got into that program. Turns out it was legit. It was the real deal. It taught you how to rank websites on Google and pretty much rent out those websites and the leads they generate to small businesses to small businesses. Um, it was a lengthy process. I mean, it took like 30 days before you could probably get paid sometimes longer from these small businesses, but it worked. And, um, this was back in late, uh, 2015 is when I got into this somewhere, somewhere around there. And, um, over the course of about 90 days, I racked up 40 clients with websites ranked on page one and page two. Wow. I move so fast. So when I tell people that story, it's like, dude, what the fuck? Like, what did you do? This is what I was doing for three months in the military at the time. So you jumped into this new whole, like new world of entrepreneurship while you're still in the military and you're sitting there executing. I want to know how the heck did you go out there and get 40 clients in such a short amount of time while still working? There's so many people out there right now that don't think it's possible because they think they don't have the time. How did you find it? How did you make it happen? Yeah, man. So 40 clients in pretty much a few months is like not easy. Um, but to me, it was like something that I wanted so bad. Like I don't care what it took. I was willing to give up like almost everything at that point because I wanted freedom like so bad to be out of like my job, so to speak. Right. Um, so pretty much when I got back from the deployment, uh, when you get back from a deployment, they pretty much give you like really light duty. Like they don't expect you for the most part and some services are different. But for me, uh, I pretty much got a pretty easy job, like almost just show up every day and like, you're good. Like I had small tasks, but I was find myself being in front of the computer, like for a, a lot of time. So, uh, I was prospecting, I was calling, cold calling clients, trying to get deals. I was taking like two hour lunch breaks. I was getting in the suit, getting in my car and driving into businesses on my lunch breaks. Um, and at four, three, three o'clock, four o'clock when I got off work, I was back in my suit going into businesses for three to four hours, trying to make deals happen. And I did that straight for three months and weekends, dude, weekends were, it was game on. I had 48 hours. When I got off work at four o'clock on Friday, I was like, I got like 60 hours to make shit happen before I have to be back here. That was my mentality. I found a way, like I didn't allow myself to say, I have a job. I have these, all these other, um, all these other commitments. Like my number one commitment at the time was to build this business so I can go out of the military and provide for my family and make an impact. So that was it, man. When I got off work, I was, I mean, like I would sleep literally probably from like midnight to five for like three months. And I still, sometimes I, I still even do that because I'm still just as like today after five years, I'm actually hungrier than I was then. You know what I'm saying? But now I actually have my time and I can actually be a little bit more sufficient and still get a little bit more sleep. But man, that was it. It was game on. In all my free time, that's all I did. I built my business. And I think a lot of people, you know, when they're trying to do something they've never done before, there's a lot of fear there. There's a lot of excuses. Like I have kids. I have a full-time job. Um, 
I don't have money. Like there's all these different things people will tell themselves, you know, and for me, I didn't have money. I was making like $3,000 a month. That's like, that's like almost minimum wage. I was $30,000 in debt. I went in debt another like eight grand because uh, I didn't have like eight grand just chilling in the bank. I probably had like 700 bucks, right? And I bought this program. So boom, no money pretty much. I put it on, I borrowed it on tomorrow, put it on credit and I sacrificed all my time pretty much into my business and I built it up really, really quick. Um, but there was an extreme downfall. So I've, I'm, I'm crushing it, right? For like six, seven months, I'm crushing it. And um, it was all based off, I was at pretty much at the, at the gods of Google and their algorithm, right? And what happened was there was an algorithm update that came out called the Penguin. If anybody watching right now, if you know about algorithm updates, they can kill you. They can either like, really, really help you and like make you rank faster or they can make your websites disappear. This one crashed my entire business. So think about it. I had 40 clients paying me somewhere between 500 to 1500 bucks a month, you know, small business clients. And I had, they were all ranked on page one. They were getting leads, getting phone calls. And then this algorithm comes out and literally all of them disappear from page one. Some of, most of them go to page two and three half of them you can't even search for the keyword wow. anymore. So, you know, to give you an example, if you, you used to be used to clean carpets, right? And people, the way people would call the company would probably search, you know, carpet cleaning company near, near me or carpet cleaning company in San Diego. That's how we were ranking the keywords. So when people search that, and if I had a carpet cleaning company, and that did, and that's Candido right up here, that website was gone. Yep. So I had 40 pissed off clients that didn't want to pay me anymore. So luckily I was able to keep half of them. I lost half of my clients. So I was making roughly 40 grand a month in the military. That's yeah. like a whole year's paycheck. If you think about it, Yeah, that's a whole year's time. I was waking that every single month. So I lost half all my clients. So I had 20 clients. I'm like, what am I going to do? You know? Um, and at the time, you know, Facebook advertising was, you know, be really getting really popular and even some of my clients were asking like about social media and stuff and it wasn't really something that we really did i was just following this one program you know and um i didn't even think to like google had advertisements and stuff but i didn't even think to get into that we just went i literally at that point i was like i gotta do something i'm just gonna go all in on social media i have facebook i know how to use facebook um and i knew that there was a lot of users at the time so and people were getting leads i was researching there was there was stuff out there we literally went all in. Um, for the first two weeks to a month, obviously I sucked. I lost half of those clients. So I had 10 clients left. But something happened. We lost all, all the major mess ups we did with those clients. We figured out for the remaining 10 clients. And I was actually able to keep those clients on board and keep them happy to clients that are actually paying my company still to this day after five years. So that's kind of like my evolution in internet marketing. And... Um, yeah, bro. It was a crazy, crazy yeah. ride. So I know that when we met each other, this was maybe about three years ago, right? Is when we really started connecting. I remember, yeah. it was the first time we met at Thrive 2 in the halls? It was. So that was yeah. the first time you came up. And I think you were kind of just like, you, you had this like really like plain face on. Like you didn't, you had like the RBS or RBF face on, like rich, rich, uh, resting bitch face kind of. And you just like came up to me and you was like, hey, like, what do you do? Or like, what is this? How do you market it? And I, I didn't know if you were a marketer, so I was kind of like on the other side, like, yeah, man, you want to check out the program? Like, here's what we have and stuff like that. Kind of left, and, and we were in contact. I think we're friends on Facebook from there. And mm -hmm. I remember one night, I needed help. I had something like, remember my Facebook ad account? Like, something happened where I couldn't publish any ads. I don't know what happened, yeah. but we were able to figure it out and fix it. And then I sat there and watched you write my copy. I was like, so what do you think we should do here? And you wrote it out, and I was like, oh, cool. What else do you think you should do? And you're like, you kept right, doing right. it. So I ran that same app for like eight months. It was hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we started building a relationship. And I remember you came to BDB Live, which is so funny for the people that are watching, because you came to the first year as an attendee. You came, you sat in the seats just like everyone else. I remember you left the event, and, and we have a program called BDB Elite that a lot of people have been watching and seeing the stories and all this stuff. Right. And you left that event and, and didn't buy any of the programs or whatever. At the time, I kind of want to just hear the story. Like, 
what made you make a different decision? And then we'll talk about like how the heck you went from the seat to the stage two years in a row. Yeah, definitely. So I pulled the whole infamous got to talk to the wife objection. Yeah. All right. Girlfriend um, at the time, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> girlfriend at the time. Um, you know, that's kind of, you know, my relationship with Sonia is everything to me. That's cool. You know, she is my bread and butter. You know, she's what I wake up for every day. You know, and she's going to be giving birth to my child. You know, so I really wanted to consult her on, on it. You know, I, I left the event definitely in a different mindset. You know, for the things you've said on stage, the speakers that you had there were just life changing. Um, and I've never made such a big purchase ever. You know, I mean, my car at the time was actually, you know, it's a lot of money, but there's a finance, you know. So for self development and personal development and to, to invest in something like this, I just never did it before. You yeah. know, people buy houses, but they buy cars, but those are depreciating values. I mean, houses can appreciate, but to actually invest in something that's going to actually build you up as a person internally so you can do better for the world. You can't, you can't even put a price on that, to be yeah. honest with you. You know, so when, when I left that event, man, um, I went back home and I told my wife, Sonia, well, girlfriend at the time, Sonia, about the opportunity. And she was like, babe, you know, I love you. I trust you. Um, it sounds like this is going to be something that's going to take us to different places that we've never been before. So cool. And she just had my back 100%. Yeah. And that's why I love her, you know, because she supports everything that I do. And, uh, you know, so I literally had gotten into pajamas, actually. Um, I went home and got into pajamas and got into flip-flops. And I kind of went home in the mindset of, like, I don't know if I'm, I don't think I'm going to do this. But I'm yeah. going to bring it up to her. And then when she said that, I was like, I'm in. That's wow. like 100% got to do yep. it. Like something was calling me back. Um, and I actually got a phone call from one of the guys that was at the event. His name's Ben. You know, Ben trains, he trains the dogs. And uh, he was like, bro, where are you at? I'm like, I'm going to come pick you up. I'm like, cool. I'm actually heading downstairs about to leave right now. He's like, what's your address? I was like, uh, here it is. So he came over, picked me up, and I went over in flip-flops. And just took out my credit card, bro, and we're here. Man. You know what's funny is that Ben didn't even come to the event. He walked in and he bought two. Oh, that's <laughs> he right. right. He didn't even attend. That's right. And he still today is like a diehard, faithful BDB. Like, it's just so cool. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit because, like, obviously money's great. There's lots of people that teach about making money. You can help people make ridiculous amounts of money. And the brotherhood that we've created is so interesting. It's something that you probably had experience in the past. But now it's like with business people. And this was the thing I wanted to create so bad. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that brotherhood people, but I don't really want to hang out with people that don't do business. Sorry for people watching. It's just, that's just what I want to do. It's so fun. Right. So like, what's for you, what's been the journey like? Like, what have you received from that? Because you had a big shift. Personally, it was, it was all you. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not taking credit for nothing. Right. I, I created an opportunity, but you had the shift and you did the things. Like, what did you accomplish since that moment? Like, where were you at and what had happened since? Yeah, man, at the time, you know, um, I was making good money. You know, I, I, had, I was making pretty much what I make a year in the military. You know, after doing Facebook ads, I was still making that in a month, you know, um, around 40 grand, right? I mean, just from a financial perspective, I was successful. I was good. Yeah. Like, that was really good, right? Um, but to tell you the truth, that hustle and that grind to be able to produce that type of income actually did affect some of my relationship with Sonia, she like undoubtedly, undoubtedly like cared for me and loved me. And I didn't always reciprocate that at, at times, but I think deep down I knew that, you know, she was the one. Um, and I knew she was the one 100%, you know, and since that event, it really opened my eyes to the people I'm surrounded with. Um, subconsciously I was actually like canceling relationships with people that weren't you know, adding to, to my life, you know, people that were negative and complaining and I didn't realize what I was doing. And I did that to the point where it was just me and Sonia all the time. Like we didn't really have any friends at all. We didn't go venture out to try to make new friends. I was doing this business thing. Nobody was really doing that. Like my first taste of it really was at Thrive when I met you. And then the cherry on the cake was, or on the pie or whatever was your event, you know? So since that event, uh, I really have a new appreciation for my well-being as a person, as, as far as my health, 
Because if I can't wake up every single day uh, and perform, I'm not going to do anything for anyone. Like I need to be 100%. Mm -hmm. My body needs to be 100%. I need to be rested. I need to be fed. I need to, I need to uh, train it. And um, I need to make money. Right? Like if you can't do anything with money, like people always think like money's like this bad thing, but it's because they don't know what to do with it. They don't understand the value of it. They don't understand that money changes the world. You know, uh, the, the most successful people in the world are doing amazing things like Elon Musk. God knows where that man's going to put us. Yeah. And he's been able to create this entire business that is so successful and he's literally changing humanity as a whole. On, on exactly how far we're going to go off this planet, you know? So I knew that if I was going to be able to feed the hungry and, 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 and try to heal poverty and build schools and do all these cool things that we're doing with our charities, I needed to make money if I was going to invest and be able to do things yeah. for those, for those organizations and for our church. Um, and then that leads me to the last one was the relationships. Who is, Who's in my circle? Who's around me? Who's sharing these ideas? Who can I bounce ideas off of? You know, what type of brothers can I go to whenever I'm in need or if I have a question? And I didn't really have that before B2B. It was literally just me and Sonia. Yeah. You know, so I think after investing into myself and coming to the events and being part of like your organization, um, I just have a newfound understanding of what a three-dimensional businessman really is. You know, so I'm very happy. I'm lean. I'm fit now. I'm freaking got off my ass. I asked my wife to marry me. We had an amazing wedding. 150 people were there from all over the world here in San Diego. We're pregnant now. We're bringing this beautiful child into the world. And we're surrounded by so many amazing people like you and your amazing wife, Amanda. You know, and uh, it's really opened me up. Now I'm like speaking on someone's stage every single month. I'm always on like a podcast like this. And it's so cool because I can share this message. And there's so many people that are able to relate to it in some way, shape, or form. I've had letters and emails, even in my coaching programs that I'm doing now, people saying that I've helped them not commit suicide. Yeah. You know, like when you get, um, when someone tells you that, I heard that you say this on the, on the podcast, it's just, you made me feel like there is hope that the grass is greener, that life is good, right? And um, I've moved into the education space where I help, at the bottom line, help people make more money. You know, that's, and, but, but I teach them that you can have all this money, but it's like, what are you going to do with it? Like, how are you going to actually, when you leave this earth and you're surrounded, when you're on your deathbed, who's going to be around you and what are they going to be saying about you? And I think about that every single day, you know? Who is going to be around me? What they be saying? What's going to be my legacy? So, I really want to leave this earth knowing that I did all I can do. I've loved as much as I could possibly love with passion, and I left a mark that people are going to be talking about for for, for years and years and centuries. Yeah. So that's the type of legacy I want to be left behind. And honestly, man, if it wasn't for you and Amanda and meeting you guys, God knows where I would be. I probably I probably maybe still would still be in the military. I probably wouldn't have achieved the new heights. Maybe it would have taken me a lot longer. But knowing you guys being involved with you literally just put steroids in it. And um, and here we are today. I'm so blessed and thankful that you know, I got to meet you. And, and uh, it's kind of propelled so much of the success we have today. So I just want to say thank you, brother. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's reciprocated. And I'm excited to have you at BDB Live. And this was just a little tidbit of, of what we're actually going to be going over there. And you got to talk about a story, but now it's like, that superpower that's allowed him to transform other lives. I'm excited for you to release that on other people and have their moment that they want to be on that stage. Like they want to have that transformation. They want to make millions of dollars, but they want to do it with the correct foundation that has purpose and that same type of motivation that he has. So thanks so much for coming on the show, man. And I'm excited to see you and them at BDB Live. Awesome, bro. I'm very excited too. Thanks, man. Thanks, bro.